Well, amen. Good to be back at the Mount Olive Baptist Church. Certainly good to see these familiar faces and all the dear people of Mount Olive. Uh, I guess I have helped here in this church in revival uh, probably more than any other church. I don't know why that is. I told my brother Les, going over to Mount Olive to preach revival, he said, I don't know why them people keep getting you to come back over there. And uh, they're going to get tired of you. And that may be so. You may be tired of me. But I love you. I was telling your pastor, your new pastor, he'll go to Dare. And he's still on his honeymoon around here. And uh, we're proud of Brother Dare. And I was telling him, I've been in a lot of revivals down through the years. Just I can't tell you how many I've been in. And uh, Some churches you get asked to go to. And it's just a real struggle going. It's a struggle there. And, uh, and it's just, you know, you can't wait to get done with the end of the week. But it has never been that way at Mount Olive Baptist Church. When they called me to, there and called me to come, it's, well, an excitement filled me. And I was excited about coming here and being here. And, and uh, I love this place. This is a special place to me. And God has blessed my heart many times here in this church, and you people are just so precious, and I love you, and I've had it, I had it laid up for Brother Gerald, ever since I found out we were going to help the revival, and I'm praying Gerald will get saved this week, and if he... <laughs> so we'll just pray for him, all right, but I'm excited, these are my friends, and people in my community that I've raised around, and I love, and appreciate from the depths of my heart. And I, don't, I didn't come this way to hurt you, but I did come to help and just worship the Lord with you. And I'd like to be able to say at the end of the week uh, that uh, we didn't just come for a series of meetings, but yet we came and the Lord sat down with us and blessed us and worked and moved in a great way. I know all of you heard about the revival that we had at Friendship, just came out of revival at Friendship this past week, two souls saved and had the best revival we've ever had since I've been there at Friendship uh, this morning. But back in the winter time, we had a youth revival. And uh, the Lord sat down with us for two whole weeks and blessed and uh, never been in revival like that in my entire life. I'm telling you, God sat down. And, and uh, I prayed for many years that God would send revival my way and I'd be a part of it and get to witness it. And I was proud to witness it at the end of two weeks of revival just at Friendship. There's professed 38 to be saved and around the sister churches up around Delonica there was somewhere around 60 that professed to be saved in a two-week time period. But I want to tell you what it took to get that and I have that revival. Revival is not free. It comes with a price. I was in my study praying that night, that evening before our revival. Had it scheduled for I don't know how long, probably a month, two months in advance, and had the preachers lined up ready to go. That Saturday night before the revival started, I was down in my study where I read and, uh, and, and got all my books, my library books, and I'll and, and I get down there later the night and read. And it was about 9 o'clock, 9.30, somewhere around there, and I was in my study. I just closed my Bible, bowed my head, and God was moving and stirring in my heart. Brother Darren, this is what I said. If you don't believe me, that's your business between me and God. I said, God, we need revival. I need it. And these were the exact words I said to him. I didn't get in a big way about praying, but God moving in my heart. I said, God, whatever it takes, send revival to friendship and to belonging. In 20 minutes time, I was laying in my bed and my brother Les was on the other end of the line. He said, couldn't understand him. He was crying. And upset. I said, what's the matter, Les? And I had to just about yell at him on the phone to tell him to calm down so I could hear him. He said, I've just left. Just left the wreck where two of our dear members have been in a car wreck and they're fixing one of them's dead at the scene and another one's fixing to die. That Gillard Youth Choir was scheduled to sing that next night in revival. Those two girls that were a big part of that youth choir, one of them killed and the other one gone. And as soon as I prayed that, I, as soon as Les called that, and I remembered the prayer I prayed, and God said, you asked for it, and here it is. It's a high price. We came that close to canceling the revival. And here's what God did in the midst of that revival. Those young people would go around the grave, or go around the, up, to the, uh, uh, up to the funeral home before they had her at the graveside, 
And they'd look at her body and they'd begin to think, that could have been me. A high price had to be paid. To have revival, there's got to be a broken, contrite spirit and realize where you're at. And when God was finished after two weeks of revival, 38 professed to be saved. And I saw the glory of God come down. People of friendship can testify. There was a, the old preachers used to talk about a holy glow. Sat down at Friendship Baptist Church for two weeks. It's like you could have turned the lights out and they'd been light and still been shining. You say, I don't believe that. That's your business. You oughtn't been there. If you want revival, Mount Olive, it's going to take a high price. And don't be like I did and pray a prayer. And God answered my prayer. And I'm not saying you she's killed because of my prayer. But I'm saying I begged for revival and we got it. But there was a price that had to be paid for it. Don't wait for some tragedy to take place before you go into revival. Do you hear me tonight, Man Olive? Do you hear me tonight? We can have revival, but we've got to be willing to let go and let God. And we can see God's glow around the church see God bless. That's my desire and my prayer uh, for this week around Mount Olive Baptist Church. 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter number 21. I want to read just a, a, a very familiar portion of God's Word in your hearing. I promise you I won't keep you long. I've got a lot of uh, revivals to help in this year and uh, just uh, in the thick of revivals and try to uh, be patient with my voice, uh, be wise with my words and and uh, in the way that I exert myself. Someone said, won't you just get up and teach? Don't you get it? I'm not just a teacher. I'm a preacher. I can't help it. I end up preaching and get excited. But I appreciate the, the help of the Lord. Do covet your prayers. 1 Kings 21, verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth. Whither is he gone down to possess it? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possessions? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. There was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all the things that uh, as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Our Father, we bow in your good presence now one more time, we thank You for this time of reading and preaching Your Word. We stand at the threshold of revival, God, and I pray, O oh Father, You'd move this week around Mount Olive. I pray You'd stir the waters around here, and God, You'd uh, manifest Yourself in a great way. Help me to get out of the place. and Get out of the way. And Lord, uh, get into Your place where You want to bless. Help everyone here to be obedient under Your will. Thank You, God, for what You've done in days gone by here in this good church. And I pray You'd bless again. And I pray that if there's one lost, Lord, here this week, God, I pray, Lord, that they'd come and 
Know you in the free pardon of sin and surrender all and be saved. Have you a perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I would like to preach this evening with a thought that the Lord has given me just last week. And I'd like to preach on the subject on, on sin. Think about it now. Sin's companions. I'd like to preach on sin's companions. Now, I'm not here to start the revival and downgrade anybody at the beginning of a revival. But I am here to tell you this, revival will not come if there's sin in the camp. Will not come. What happened to the days when preachers would stand boldly against sin and say, sin is sin, right is right, and wrong is wrong. But I want to say that if we're going to have revival around Mount Olive this week and there's sin in your life, It needs to be dealt with. Sin today is something that we're all acquainted with. You're clothed with it. You wake up with it. You live in it, breathe in it. You're you're in sin every day just because you're in flesh. But I want to say that this flesh today can be tamed. It can be trained. It can be uh, put in a place where God can still work with that flesh and still bless even in the midst of the flesh that you have. Right? You'll notice here in the Scripture that sin was something that Ahab was, uh, uh, he wasn't just dealing with it, he was up to his eyeballs in it. Ahab was one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had. Jezebel, we know her as being a wicked, wicked lady. And I'll go as far to say this, Ahab was a weak, spineless man, but he was a man that was so engrossed in sin Uh, that uh, his wife could tell him to do this or do that, and all he'd do is follow like a dog on a leash or a chain. I want to say this in in the outstart of this message, uh, that sin is something that we all have to deal with. And uh, now don't judge a message before I get done with it, but I want to say that just because you come to church faithfully, just because you come and sing in the choir and because you teach Sunday school, whatever office you have, it is completely possible for you to be living in sin and still be faithful to the house of God. And I want to say it's real easy. Now, remember, this was a king of Israel. He was an, uh, Israel is a, an illustrious nation at this time. They are a, a, a wonderful people, though they're in sin. And day by day, they were living and drifting deeper and deeper into sin. I want to say the devil's a real uh, tricky character. He's not going to throw the whole meal at you at one time. He'll give you a bite here, a bite there, and the next thing you know, you're out of God's will. You're out of fellowship. You say, well, I tell you don't know my life, preacher. I know that. I don't. But I do know this, that preaching and pastoring down through the years that I've seen people one by one that used to be on fire. Now they've just drifted out. There they are in sin. Their families aren't coming to God's house anymore. They don't go anywhere. And it didn't happen just overnight. And I want to say it is completely possible for you here tonight to be out of God's will and still be faithful to the house of God. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You don't have to be addicted to drugs. You don't have to be addicted to uh, the filth that's on uh, the Internet. But I want to say it is real easy for God's people uh, to be dabbling in sin and not even realize it. Amen. I remember when I was a young man, I had the bright idea, Brother Darren, I was going to build me a deer stand over on the side of the woods. And it was about September and the leaves hadn't started falling good yet. And I climbed up in a tree and there in the midst of that tree I built a good deer stand. And after I got down I began to itch. And I, I began to itch all over. And literally I was so excited about building that deer stand uh, that I didn't look and see all the poison that was up and down that tree. I was eat up with it. And there I was. I, I, was, uh, I didn't realize it was 
was all there. And I wished a thousand times over I'd never even thought about deer hunting after it got over with. Uh, but it, little by little, I climbed up that tree. And that sin, that, that sumac was all over my arms and my neck. I had to go to the doctor and get a shot about it. I want to say it's real easy for God's people to do the same thing. It looks good the first time, uh, but I want to say that uh, uh, the companion of sin today and the sins of life, it may look good, it may draw you, and it may compel you, but the end result is always danger. It is always death. It is always hurting. You know this story well. Naboth there had a vineyard hard by uh, the palace there in Jerusalem or Israel. There he was, and I can see uh, Ahab looking down and said, I'd like to have that vineyard. I'd like to have that. And look, I'd see myself uh, going down there, and there he is coveting what his neighbor had. He just wanted it there just for himself. He didn't need it. He had plenty of uh, other ones to tend to. But he looked at that vineyard, and uh, all of a sudden the seed was planted, and he began to covet that, and he wanted that. And don't you look up here tonight and act like uh, uh, you people have never coveted anything. How many times have you ever walked uh, or drove by somebody's house and said, I'd like to have their house, and not content with the one you've got? Amen tonight. How many times have you looked at that vehicle going down the road and said, I'd like to have that. God says, that's not yours, that's somebody else's. And uh, listen, that uh, being content is something you and I all have to deal with. It's not that God does not want to bless, and it is not that God does not bless, but I want to say that we got to be careful. Little by little, we'll drown ourselves in sorrows, wishing uh, that we had more when God says, you've got enough. And I want to say being content is what we all need to do. He was discontented. Here he is. He looks down and he says, I want that. I want it for myself. And his wicked wife schemes a plot and a plan and destroys this man, has him stoned and murdered if you'll have it. And there she was. She said, here you go, honey. Uh, he pouted around the house. He uh, didn't need to eat uh, uh, his supper, didn't eat his breakfast, uh, didn't eat his lunch. And she said, I'll get it for you if you're not man enough to get it. And there she did, uh, uh, did the evil work. And I want to show you this today. He was selfish in what he wanted. He wasn't thinking about somebody else. And I want to say the selfishness of sin has crept into our churches today. And listen, we uh, uh, get jealous at so and so and uh, well somebody's better than me. Uh, somebody does this better than I do. Uh, look what they've got. Uh, isn't that the scheme of things today? Everybody wants what everybody else has got. Amen preacher. And I want to say that we need to be careful and not be selfish in sin. And I want to say sin today. I uh, will drag a church down, it'll drag an individual down, and thank God it'll uh, uh, drag uh, the world down, amen. I want to say this, that he was so selfish, he didn't care about somebody else's life. Now you may not care about me tonight, and that's, that's fine. But you better care about the little kids around here that's never been saved. Are you willing to go through a whole week and wait till the end of the revival Friday night or the revival Saturday whenever we end up here and, and at the end of the week and say, well, you know, I, I should have repented of that sin and God could have blessed and uh, blessed in the service and you wait till the end of the week and that little soul that's on its way to hell and God's been drawing that little one to come and be saved and you could be the one that's so selfish with your sin and your pride uh, that you you won't turn it loose uh, and that little one miss heaven because of you. You say, well, it don't work that way. Sure it does. Sin has companions to it. He wanted something. He was selfish. Then he had to pay for it. Now let me throw this at you for just a minute. God brought it to my attention this evening in my study. You'll notice that sin is all over the United States of America. Can I get an amen on that? We're living in a time when sin is, listen, sin is more, uh, uh, more rampant and abundant and it's more welcome than righteous living. The way we worship, the way Mount Olive worships and friendship worships and the way that we are and live our lives, we're the one that everybody thinks are crazy. 
They think that because I preach and your pastor preaches the way that he does, they think we're the one that's lunatic. We're the one that's in the wrong. But I want to say today, that sin that they're living in, that the world has and uh, is saturated with, it will always end in death. Sin, when it is finished, it always brings forth death. And whatever sin it is, whether it be greed, covetousness, adultery, a fornicate, whatever it is, a friend, there's always a penalty to that sin. And I want to say the sin that we're seeing run rampant in our nation today is the homosexual movement and uh, uh, this uh, a new age movement of uh, if it feels good, just to, don't cut me off tonight. I feel that. I want to say this. Uh, that movement that's going through our land of uh, something that uh, we're the ones in the wrong for standing on the Bible. We're the ones that don't have the right to preach the gospel of Jesus. But I want to say today what God's Word says still stands. It is still right. And it'll stand when we're dead and gone. It'll stand uh, when the world's on fire. And I want to tell the church today uh, because everybody else is in sin. Uh, doesn't mean we've got to devil in it, amen. Sin today is all around us. I'm protecting my kids the best way I know how. They some TV shows. Well, son, you're not watching that. You say, Daddy, why not? I said, because it's not right. We don't allow that in our house. The occult is running rapid in our nation. Witchcraft. Think about it. Just look at the televisions of what's going on. Think of... Uh, all the, uh, just, just free living. If it feels good, do it. Sin always comes with a price in the homosexual movement. Don't cut me off tonight. Uh, listen, they say, well, it's all right. I love this person. I love that person. Uh, but they're not looking at years down the road of all the venereal diseases that they contract from that field. And all the partners they have. If it feels good, do it. what they say. Uh, the end result is always death. That's not freedom. Uh, that's death, amen. Amen today. Sin always has a companion with it. It looks good. Go ahead and taste this and do that. I want to say be careful what you reach for. Be careful where you go, people. Because you carry the name of Jesus with you. This man was so selfish. He didn't care who, what it cost him. He didn't care whose life was affected. And mothers and dads, you hear me today. What you do affects your family. It doesn't just affect the immediate family, but it goes from generation to generation. Three and four generations down from you. Uh, it will affect them from the choices you make today uh, and the things you do not do. Uh, it will affect you. Amen. I've never seen such a day when kids are going up in broken homes. Never seen such a day when people don't care nothing about the Word of God. You preach your heart out, Brother Darren, and they'd look at you and laugh at you. Two years ago, I was up preaching out the church, and we have so many visitors come through there. So you don't know who's going to show up. Kids of the college showed up, and they was... Man, I'm telling you, it broke my heart. I was up preaching the best way I know how, and I know I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not polished and refined like some of them are. But I tell you what they did. I was up preaching. I got in a big way about preaching. And them kids got up and run out while I was preaching, laughing at me. And I wasn't mad at them. I wished I'd, I, if I'd have done, if I'd have, after thinking about it, I wished I'd have stopped them and said, just give me a few minutes of your time. Please sit back down. But I didn't. And I want to say, listen, this, uh, uh, this age of uh, making fun of the preachers and making fun of the churches today, you think it's bad now. Wait in a few years and see what happens, amen. When everybody on the White House Hill turns against from God, they turn against the Word of God, they say it's just a book, it's just a fairy tale. But I want to say it's not. It is the living, breathing, infallible Word of God. And I want to say the only help for our sinful nation is found in the writings of this book. Uh, the only help for our 
our leaders today is found on their knees praying to a holy God and say, Lord, forgive our nation. Uh, forgive us today. Uh, why we're not seeing revival in our land anymore is because of one thing. Uh, uh, we have failed to repent. Uh, we failed to come to God. Uh, it starts at the family. starts at the home in the church. Uh, and thank God, uh, if we'll turn back to God, uh, He will hear our prayers. Uh, he'll hear our land. Uh, and He'll make us a fit subject for revival. Sin carries a companion with it. Notice what He did. He sold out to wickedness. Look in verse 20. Thou hast sold out thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Man, I've seen it time and time again. People have been raised under my ministry and their kids grow up and they go off. Now, some of them's ended in a good church. And they get out of church and you wonder where they're at and you pray for them, beg them to come back. And in their heart, they're laughing and say, I don't need that old time religion. I don't need it. I don't need the power and presence of God. I'm fine. I've got money. I've got plenty to eat. I've got wealth. I've got it all. I've got an education. I don't need your God. But then when they come down to sickness and sorrow and their families are strewn all over the world and their families are beat up and uh, uh, they're, they're hungry and they don't have anything, then they come crawling back to God I'm here to give you some advice today. The companion of sin will always bring you down. But when you get to the lowest point of your life, and you get where that you realize how that you need God back in your soul, back in your life, then God will work. God will give peace and God will thank you what you need. Now, He may not take away the result of your sin. He will forgive you. He says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad tonight, dear Christian? When we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He, uh, uh, he'll forgive us and cleanse us. That does not mean you won't pay for your sin. Uh, uh, some men years ago told me this. I said, uh, I, said he, I was bad to drink and uh, I was an alcoholic. And he said, thank God, God saved me. Uh, God delivered me from that. Uh, but when he got over, he suffered from liver disease. Uh, uh, God delivered him. Uh, and that sin of, uh, of taking that uh, hard drink uh, uh, destroyed his liver. And God will forgive. And God will make well. Uh, uh, but does not mean God won't allow us to pay for our sin. Uh, aren't you glad today uh, uh, that Jesus died uh, and he rose again the third day? Uh, he's got more power over sin uh, and over the wicked world. Uh, but I want to say if we fail to fall on our knees before him, we will suffer the penalty of sin. You always got a companion. He won't drag you down. Amen tonight. But I'm already sweating. I want to ask you tonight on a personal level, have you sold out to God or to your will and your wicked way? Well, I've not done anything wrong. I've never murdered nobody. I've not committed adultery. By you saying no to God and what He asked you to do this week, you're selling out to yourself instead of God. Amen to that. When God says come, you ought to stand up and say, Yes, Lord, I'm here. When God says go tell someone you love them, you ought to stand up and run to them. Go give them a hug. Whatever you got to do, love them. When God says you need to go to the altar, there's some sin that you committed years ago and He's brought to your attention. My best advice to you is get an altar somewhere and ask God to pray. I don't want to know about it. Your pastor don't want to know about it. But I tell you, go to God on, on, on your own behalf and ask God to forgive you. He'll cleanse you of that sin. And any sin that you have in your life this week that needs to be dealt with, friend, you better turn it over to God. But uh, when, when you don't do that, when you don't give in to God and give in to asking God to forgive you, you are hurting the church and hurting the revival. And listen, you're hurting the lost soul. Give in. I don't know anybody's heart. But I do know this. I know what it is to be a sinner. I know what it is to live just like everybody else does. 
One preacher stood up and said, I ain't sinned in 25 years. I said, well, he just did. He just lied to everybody. There ain't nobody in here perfect. I don't care who you are. Ain't nobody here better than anybody else. You get up and walk like I do, eat breakfast like I do, you get up and take a shower just like I do, and you smell like I do, and walk and eat and do everything just like I do. There ain't nobody perfect in here. First one stand up and say he's better than somebody else ought to get right. Amen. I want to say today, listen, what we need to do is realize where we are and who God is. And when we let God be God in our life, then the glory can shine through in our soul. I need to ask God to forgive us every day. Before I came here, I said, God, if there's anything in my heart that's keeping me from doing what you want me to do, show me and I'd make it right. You want revival, Mount Olive? I mean, are you willing to pay the price for it? Are you willing to let go of the sin of your life? I believe God wants to do work around here. I really do. I believe God wants to work in this church, work in your pastor's life, work in my life, work in my family's life. If there's something you need to let go of, I believe it's high time we let it go. Maybe somebody you're upset with, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not calling names. I don't know anything about anybody here tonight. Something you got upset with years ago, don't you think it's high time let bygones and be, be bygones, wave the flag of surrender, and get busy serving God? Amen. Amen tonight. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, we're living in a day when churches would rather bicker and fuss and fight than go to meeting and then serve and worship God. You say, well, it's not happening here. It might not be, but it could happen down the road. I want to say this tonight. We better get to the place where we're, where we're God is number one and it's high time that we let go of self, let go of what we think church is, and let God be what He is. I had the privilege last night to be over at Mount Zion had three saved last night of the revival. All the field up. The glory of God sat down on the church. And I told this church, and I had to repent of it. But Darren, this is what I said. I'm about done. I'm, I'm about, about to close. Don't, don't, don't turn me off just yet. Wasn't much happening at the beginning of service. Everybody was tired and wore out. I was tired. Friendship was tired. I was sitting there and I said, God, there ain't much going on. I'm ready to go to the house. So what I said in my heart, I didn't say that loud, but I said it in my heart. And I just sat there, dead as a hammer. Next thing I know, somebody run in the altar, a little girl running in the altar. She got saved. The little brother got saved in the back there. And then Stephen Gerald's little girl got saved last night. His youngest little girl, Hannah, did. And I looked up and I said, God, I'm sorry. I should not have said that in my heart. I said, Lord, forgive me. The next thing I know, I was happy with the rest of them. When I said, God, forgive me, He let me start enjoying it. And I want to say, I was tired in flesh. And I've been tired. I've been going, I don't know how many, how many weeks. Uh, I'm just going and, and, and working and uh, trying to run revivals and do this. And I got tired in the flesh. And just that little slip up, I said, Lord, I'm ready to go home. And God said, I'll show you who's in charge. And listen, I, let, I said, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And listen, if the preacher can do it, and you'll be honest tonight, the deacon can do it. The Sunday school teacher can do it. The choir director can do it. Anybody here is not above it. You here tonight, you want to see God bless, ask God to forgive you of your sins and sanctify yourself before we go any further. I'm about to, we was in that revival and these kids come all, I mean, just filled the house up. I don't know, we, we tried to count one night. 350, I guess. I don't know, they had doors open that week, that Tennessee weather, and they had the doors standing open. Air conditioner running in the middle of January. And I thought, man, man, I've never seen it like. And people that didn't even know that they were sinners, when they got to church, they knew something was the matter with them. They ran to the altar. And when it come time for invitation, they wasn't no preachers getting down. You couldn't get down beside them. You couldn't move. Am I not telling it right, friendship? Preachers couldn't get down beside nobody. 
they got down. They just get down and pray. And little by little, they'd get to pray, and the choir would sing and, and lead the invitation, and they'd stand up and say, "God just saved me from my sin." That's what that was their testimony. Nobody told them to do it; they just did it. And I, and I sat back amazed and seeing God doing that. And here they, some of them kids had never stepped foot in the house of God, but yet they knew they needed something, some relief from their sin. Now, if somebody here today walks in and they don't know anything about church, and they can come in and get saved and get things right, what's wrong with God's people today? Why can't we come in every Sunday? Come on now. And say, Lord, forgive me. Something God spoke to you hard about that you need to talk to Him about? Something you need to confess? I'm going to make my confession right here. And, and, and I'm, I'm going I'm to leave you happy. I confess that, God, I need you. I want to see you work this week. And I'd like to see a revival break out like we saw in the wintertime at Green Chief. Wouldn't you like to see that? How many believe it could happen? I believe it could happen. I've seen it happen. But you're going to have to pay the price. And you're going to have to ask God, say, Lord, if there's something in my life that's between me and you, you're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to deal with it. If you don't bring it to the preacher, you take it right to God. Old Dean Bryant used to tell it the best. And we also always had a prayer meeting. Let's come with a song right quick. Where, where, where you at? Yeah. Come with a song, Brother Jeff. When we'd go down Wahoo, and they'd have prayer before service, he never would go. And I always wondered, little boy, why Dean wouldn't go pray with everybody. And as all the men would come up, he'd preach to every single one of them. He says, you boy, you ought to be prayed up before you come to the prayer ground. So you wouldn't have to go down there and pray and beg God to do something. You ought to be coming with the spirit and attitude that God is already doing something. I remember seeing him do that. Now, Darren, I'm going to pray with you every night. I'm going to be back there, okay? I'm, no, I'm not Dean Bryan. I can't do that. Play softly when you get it. But I believe before you come to Revival Mount Olive, you need to be already be praying before you get here. I ain't got it in my back pocket. Darren ain't got it. These guys ain't got it. And you don't got to work nothing up. When God gets on the scene, Really, there ain't no preaching. Really, got to be a whole lot done. God sits down in a congregation. Everybody sit back in amazement and awe, and say, "Look at the glory of God." I've seen it. I feel it. I've witnessed it. And God wants it to happen around Mount Olive Church. I saw people run into the house of God that week. They parked all up down the bypass, and I said, "God." I'd love to see souls running the house of God. I saw them running at 6.30 at night. They can tell you, I'm telling the truth. Running to get in the house just to get a seat. Running down the bypass to get in Friendship Baptist Church. And I'd drive up on the, get up on the porch and say, Lord, what have you done? What in the world have you done? Do you want to see God work like that? You can. But you've got to repent, confess some things, and come to God. I've seen Him work. And I'm telling you the truth. He wants to bless this week. Our Father, we come to You now. And we thank You, God, that You're moving and working at the Mount Olive Church. And I pray tonight will be the starting point of this good revival. I know You want to work. And God, if there's something in my life that I need to do about, get better about, help me to be a better person. And help me to repent of it. And forgive me of it. And Lord, I pray, God, that You'd just help this church. I pray You'd settle in with us here around Mount Olive. God, Your glory would manifest Yourself around this place. God, that people and neighbors would have to just come see what's going on around Mount Olive this week. And souls would get saved, and we'd all have to stand back and say, God, You get all glory, and You get all honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, there, as we stand all over the house. Something you need to talk to the Lord about. At the start of this revival, something you need to ask forgiveness for. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, there, as we stand all over the house. Something you need to talk to the Lord about. At the start of this revival, 
something you need to ask forgiveness from.